Welcome to the channel guys, Ed Budd here. Lots of interesting discussion within the running community over the last week in terms of the legality of the Nike Alpha Fly that Elliot Kipchoge used within his recent 159 INEOS challenge. Today I'd like to discuss the pros and cons of using those carbon fibre plate shoes. Whether a band's really needed, is it even reasonable to suggest that a band should be required? So I want to look at the pros and cons, for and against. I certainly use these shoes, I enjoy using them, I enjoy running in them. I have my reasons for that and I will go through and talk about those. But I want to present both sides of the argument. So lots of interesting discussion over the last week with the carbon fibre plate legality debate rearing its head once again. Right, so let's firstly state some facts here. I've seen lots of other videos, lots of other publications, posts, all sorts of things um, which have some varying degrees of accuracy to them. So cutting through some of that dubious information, let's get things straight. There are three key events that we need to think about here in terms of carbon fiber plate shoes, or at least that's kind of how I look at it in my mind. Elliot Kipchoge has been involved in three of the fastest marathons uh, run over the last couple of years. The first being back in 2017 with the Breaking 2 project. The second, the Berlin Marathon of 2018, and then of course third, the INEOS 159 Challenge a couple of weeks back. None of those shoes have been particularly widely available to the public. I say particularly available because Nike have kind of circumvented that. Nike have released one of the shoes at least um, in a very small batch. You know, it is available. You can go out and buy it if you wanted to. So for breaking two, Elliot Kipchoge wore the Vaporfly Elite, not the 4%. It is, was, he never wore the 4%, this was the Vaporfly Elite. The Elite has a lot more in common in terms of the next percent than it does the 4%. The Elite here had a fly knit upper, as opposed to the vapor weave stuff that you have on the next percent. In Berlin, he wore the Vaporfly Elite again, this time a red model. There's probably a few changes to it. We'll never perhaps really know what the differences were, but he did wear a Vaporfly Elite model in that race. Again, not the 4%. It wasn't this shoe, he didn't wear this. It, it, it's different, it's got that different outsole and the midsole was different, it wasn't the 4% in Berlin. So that brings us to the INEOS 159 challenge. You would have seen all the fantastic paces there were in the pink Vaporfly next percent. So pink version of this, much larger midsole, more Zoom X material there, and this differing outsole pattern. Obviously, Elliot was wearing the Alpha Fly, or the Vaporfly, Alpha Fly, whatever it's called. We don't really know yet, do we? We don't know an awful lot about this shoe. We know it's got a different upper, etc. We know that there's more Zoom X, we know there's different plates, and so blah, 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 blah. We'll go on about that later. But certainly the shoes that the Pacers wore were commercially available to the public. That other shoe, the one that Elliot wore for the 159 Challenge, is not available to the public as yet. It's a prototype shoe. So there's a higher stack height in the Alpha Fly. There's three carbon plates, four zoom, four? four zoom air bags apparently. There's some discussion about that, they're zoom air or whether they're tensile air. Um, I've watched lots of videos about tensile air units that seem to be similar type things using pieces of fiber which then gets kind of crushed down as you push onto them and they quickly return to uh, their original state. But certainly those air bags are kind of stacked on top of each other in the forefoot area, right under the ball of the foot. And that upper, it seems to be a different type of knit to fly knit. It's called atom knit. Um, I would suggest it's just a much more densely packed set of fibers, perhaps thinner fibers, to provide the strength and structure and protection over the top of the forefoot. The three plates appear to work in a different way this time from looking at the drawings, the patent drawings at least. I would suggest one of the plates is actually there to provide some structure and kind of hold the airbags kind of together. Um, we all know ZoomX, or at least those of us that have used ZoomX shoes, is extremely squashy. It's very, very springy, bouncy. Let me feel the shoe and tell you what I feel. It has a certain spongy texture to it. Almost elastic kind of feeling. That's another thing that makes me laugh. Lots and lots of people are talking about these shoes and saying, no, oh, they shouldn't be used, shouldn't use them, this, that and the other. They haven't used them themselves. They 
don't want to use them for whatever reason. Those of you that use the um, the Pegasus Turbo, uh, which has a Zoom X layer and then a React layer, that React layer to me helps to provide a little more structure to the shoe. I think if you just had a shoe with completely Zoom X uh, within the midsole, with nothing there to provide any structure, it would be a bit of a floppy kind of mess. Kind of like wearing a haddock on your foot. That's kind of how I kind of envisage it. Maybe a haddock who has eaten um, several pieces of jello or jelly, you know. Um, that's that's kind of how I feel it might be. Sorry if I've offended anybody who's particularly uh, you know, has a pet haddock or anything like that. So I really think that plate that's in the forefoot section of the shoe is there to provide a bit of structure around those airbags. The other two probably for a more propulsive kind of feeling perhaps, I don't know, the, the, the plate on the top looks like it's there to again provide some structure. It's quite a different shoe really when you look, when you think about the midsole. It, it really is set up in a very different way to the Vaporfly 4% or the Next percent So technical talk over. In short, should or could the uh, International Association of Athletics Federations ban the use of the Vaporfly shoes. As I said, I want to try and present both sides of the argument here. So this shoe certainly does seem to improve the performance or maybe efficiency of athletes. It seems to lessen fatigue as well. People seem to be finishing races with a lot more power and energy than they did before. So like the next percent, you know, the 4% that came before it, this has been available to members of the public, to consumers, if you will, um, for quite some time now. At the start of a race, you can't get away from it. Loads of people are wearing these shoes now. I remember possibly must have been sort of March time of 2019. There weren't really that many people wearing these shoes. And then suddenly Nike seemed to have released them onto the market in a greater quantity and lots of people have them. These things are certainly costly, I think you'd agree. I think that next percent is certainly going to prove to be a little more durable. All that aside, you know, I've used this shoe for about, what, 170 odd miles now? It's a bit of degradation here at the back of the shoe, perhaps where I've got a little bit sloppy with my foot strike. But apart from that, you know, it's in pretty good condition really. I use this shoe now for training. Um, I think it's racing days are probably over, but I'm never going to get rid of it. There's a lot of sentimental value about this shoe. I won't be getting rid of this one anytime soon. I feel that the next percent certainly a bit more stable in terms of this rear section of the foot. I think it's a bit more stable at the forefoot as well. There's a slightly increased width here around about the ball of your foot. So that's probably the point I'm kind of aiming to hit at least. People keep telling me about my form and it's probably not the best. I know that. I'm not an elite athlete. I'm just a bloke that likes running an awful lot. Possibly a little bit too much actually. Um, when you look outside, it's raining and it's windy and you still really want to get out there and run. I think that probably says a lot about me. Yeah, I think these shoes say a lot about me as well. What does it say? I'm the Imelda Marcos of the running shoe world, something like that. Anyway, let's get back on track, I digress. I certainly think this gives uh, the runner a lot more protection. There's certainly better grip as well. There's better traction in this forefoot area. So both of those shoes, the 4% and the next percent, are reasonably available to runners. That's one of those kind of rules that the IAF stated, you know, that the shoes have to be reasonably available. They are now, whether that's always been the case, you know, with some of those very early kind of prototypes, they've kind of released them just before certain runners have used them. I'll let you make your own assumptions about that. And it's kind of circumventing a rule, isn't it, really? I think we can't forget that the recent Ineos 159 challenge was a challenge, it wasn't a race. The only competitor was Kipchoge. You know, there was nobody else. The pacers were just there to kind of back him up. So this wasn't a race, we have to remember that. Let's not forget that the women's marathon record was broken the other day in Chicago. She was wearing a pair of the next percent. That lady's clearly at the top of her game, but you know, did those shoes give her an advantage? I'd suggest she's just a fantastic runner and she's put loads of training in. And you know, the shoes, well, why not wear the best you can get? I've often suggested to runners that the Vaporfly 4% needs time. You need to spend some time with it to get the best out of it. It's kind of like buying like a new guitar and instantly expecting to be able to play like Joe Satriani. It's just not going to happen. You need to spend some time with the shoe and understand how you can get the best out of it. You need to spend time with those shoes to kind of fully get the gist of them and understand 
um, how you can get the best from them. It's all about improving that gait, that form, that efficiency in your running. So does the presence of the shoe itself, you know, kind of urge the runner to improve all of those things? Is it an incentive for runners to kind of improve and get better in terms of their actual form and the mechanics of their running when you get these shoes? I'd suggest yes, it probably is. In the past, you know, I've bought myself perhaps a new guitar, for example, and I've spent hours and hours, you know, playing this guitar and really getting to grips with it, understanding what sounds I can get out of it. I think that's probably the same with this shoe. Many people are saying, you know, you need a level playing field in running. You know, surely some people have got greater lung capacity, the right length legs, you know, feet, the ideal size, no respiratory issues like asthma. You know, when does someone's body actually become an advantage or a barrier? Let's not forget, guys, that many shoe companies have utilized carbon plates within their shoes. You know, Hoka here, the Carbon X. It's even got that rocker kind of design as well. The Zoom Fly Flyknit, that's got the same carbon fiber plate as the Vaporfly. Yep, nobody ever mentions about that. Going back some years, who remembers the Adidas Predator football boots, the soccer boots, with those kind of ridged areas on the front of the shoe? So you could bend the ball better, you could curve the ball. Surely that's providing an advantage, right? The removal of laces from shoes, is that providing an advantage? Or just, just technology, surely, isn't it? What about torsion? Everybody was talking about Adidas torsion at one point. You know, certainly for running. Brooks Fusion carbon plate shoe back in 1993. Surely that should have been banned. I'm being silly, right? My good old favorite here, the Zoom Fly Flyknit. You know, it says here, full length carbon fiber plate within the midsole. You know, should, should we consider banning this one too? Is it about the carbon fiber plate or is it the design here that's the issue? You know, this shoe here is where you can buy it for 60 pounds on the Nike store at the moment. 60 pounds do the iaf need to look into that as well you know jim wormsley broke the 50 mile record recently in the carbon x nobody's talking about banning that one that's even got a different carbon fiber plate it's like a fork one end of the fork going up towards the larger toe and one end towards the other toes all the competitors in that event with the carbon x kind of launch were all wearing that shoe but that didn't seem to generate anywhere near the hysteria or discussion about the legality of carbon plate shoes. I was looking earlier about the uh, Vaporfly Elite that Kipchoge wore in the Berlin race back in 2018. You can actually buy that shoe if you wanted to now. Um, I've got to be honest, I was slightly tempted for about one second. It's a ridiculous price, but you know, someone is selling that shoe in my size. Just think of that. So they release that shoe in very small quantities to kind of circumvent the rules that are there. It's a ridiculous cost. And some people say that, you know, this is giving the unfair advantage to the well-off, to the people that can afford that very expensive shoe. There's probably loads of untapped potential runners out there that could probably make better use of the shoes than I can. I know that. Um, I'm extremely lucky. I am very, very thankful for the fact that I can afford to have those shoes. We have to consider in some of these races that some of us are competing and some of us are taking part. That's just the way it is. I certainly, I'm never gonna win any races. I know that. I'm a non-elite runner. I enjoy running. I'm probably not gonna ever win any of the races I take part in. I'm kind of racing against myself really to try and improve my times, to try and improve my running form and efficiency. It's only the cream of the crop that are gonna win any of those events, certainly at national or international level. A good 99% of us just love running. If a shoe gives us a slight boost in our efficiency or a reason to train harder perhaps, is that wrong? Does it make the shoe wrong? Does it make it illegal? Surely we're open to use whatever shoe we want to use. What shoe works for us, be it comfort, grip, traction, use case. You know, certainly in this country, upper material choice is really high on the, the ladder, really. It's always raining in this place, always. We need a shoe that's gonna work in wet conditions if you're in the old blighty. Some prefer shoes without carbon plates, some prefer them with. I think in short, the Vaporfly series certainly helps to boost efficiency of runners. And by efficiency, I kind of mean that mechanical efficiency. People seem to get less fatigued while wearing this shoe. I've certainly felt it, even as a non-elite runner, the days after a race, I feel a hell of a lot better if I've been wearing those shoes 
compared to something else. The legs just feel way better. It feels like there's been less punishment and less battering really. They just feel so much better. Some people though, they can't use them. They're just too narrow a shoe for them to be able to use. Certainly if you have a slightly wider foot. So these shoes don't work for everyone. They're not gonna provide an advantage for all runners. I think if you're at your top of your game, if your form is good, I think if you're efficient, I think they're gonna really work for you. Otherwise, I think they can actually work against you. I've been looking around on Nike's website and there is another shoe that does appear to use that Alpha Fly system with those airbags, or at least there's two in the LeBron 17. It has a similar air unit set up there. Is, is that allowed? That Alpha Fly shoe that Elliot wore in the Ineos Challenge certainly doesn't look like it's gonna be available for some time yet. And that's fine. It wasn't a race, it was a challenge. There were no other competitors. No rules have been broken there. I think really here, the focus of the discussion is on the Vaporfly 4% and the next percent. Or perhaps even some of these other carbon fiber plate shoes that are widely available. In short, I don't think there's gonna be any sort of ban anytime soon on these shoes. I think that these shoes can work very well for some people, not so well for other people. Just a couple of days ago in Amsterdam, the chap that won the Amsterdam Marathon was wearing the Adios 4s. He came up trumps in a very minimal shoe. Yes, Boost is a great material for energy return, but that's a minimal shoe. I think hats off to him for winning that marathon. And it's a big marathon in that type of shoe. It's a minimal shoe, there's not a lot there. Well done. Nike's been radio silent on the release of that Alpha Fly. There's only been a couple of photos officially about the shoe. And certainly looking at the photos that Kev Percent sent to us while he was over in Vienna, the LeBron 17 and the Alpha Fly there, certainly some similarities, I think you'll agree. Please comment below, let me know how you feel about this debate with carbon fiber plate shoes. Should they be banned? Should they not be banned? Do you not care? Um, I'm kind of on the not care kind of area, really. I don't think they will be banned. Um, I think that they work great for some people and not so well for others. But please comment below and let me know your views and opinions. They are certainly valued, as always, on my channel. Please hit the subscribe button. Smash that like button. Smash it. And make sure you share the video with other runners. My name's Ed Bud, and I'll be seeing you.